Amen. Now, one more quick announcement. Um, Y'all can come back tonight. It says Andrew's preaching, but uh, really I am. So uh, I, he, he pointed it out. He said, am I preaching tonight? I said, no, it was just an oops uh, from last week when he preached on Sunday night. Uh, so he was, he was really, really worried about it, to be honest with you. I said, yeah, ma'am, of course you're preaching tonight. Didn't you know that? It, no, it was all good. If you'll take your Bibles this morning and turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verse 1 through 17. A message I've entitled, A Man and His Master. You know, in our text today, we have a record of one of the events that took place at the Last Supper. That what we're celebrating today, what we're remembering today, what we're memorializing uh, today. And it's found in John 13, beginning in verse 1 down through verse 17. So read this with me. The story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come and that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And the supper being ended, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If, you do not, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. So Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. But I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. For if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Now there are some of our brothers and sisters in Christ who follow the ordinance of foot washing. And quite frankly, I can't argue with that. I, I, I really can't. You know, we do the Lord's Supper because Jesus told us to do it in remembrance of him. We baptize because Jesus was baptized there in the Jordan River and said to obey him. Jesus right here said, you do this for one another, right? And I don't know why we don't do it, but we don't. Somehow it's been lost in church tradition a little bit. But I understand that baptism is one of the ordinances of the church, and the Lord's Supper is one of the ordinances of the church, and, and there's a case to be made for foot washing. Now, I'm not going to wash feet this morning, but I'm going to tell you uh, for a fact that when Jesus taught us a remarkable lesson when he did this. Jesus blessed us as he blessed Simon Peter and the rest of them. Their background, together these men had walked those dusty roads of Galilee doing ministry. Together they had slept in the great outdoors with rocks for pillows and the stars for their rooftop. Together they had faced the winds of that storm-tossed sea, right? Together they had experienced the miracle of seeing 4,000 and then 5,000 men fed with just a small amount of food. Together, they had faced the opposition of the religious leaders and the threats of those who had set themselves against Jesus. Together, together, these were the master's men. And they gathered for one last meal before Jesus was going to accomplish what he had set out to do in this world. 
And when we see Jesus washing the feet of the disciples, in this I want us to see four things about our Savior. Four things about Jesus that we need to remember when we take this bread and this juice that symbolizes the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. What four things do we need to remember? We need to remember first what Jesus devoted himself to be, and that was our Savior, right? What Jesus devoted himself, what his sole purpose was, was to be our Savior. And it says in verse 13, verse 1, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them till the end. Jesus devoted himself to being our Savior. Jesus knew that his hour had come and he would depart the world and he loved them to the end. You know that the, me, these men were sinful and just like us and they needed a Savior. They didn't just need a friend, right? Jesus was the best friend they ever had. They didn't just need a counselor. Although Jesus was the best counselor they could have ever had. They didn't need just a helper. They needed a Savior. And we need a Savior, right? We, at one time in our life, we were lost as a ball in tall weeds. And we were headed to a sinner's hell. And you needed a Savior, and I need a Savior. Perhaps today, as you see this Lord's Supper being served, you need to understand today for the very first time that you need a Savior who is Christ the Lord. I heard about an atheist who was on a ship and this ship began to being to be tossed by the winds and the waves and the storm just keep in kept intensifying. And finally this atheist dropped down to his knees and raised his hands to heaven and said, Oh God, help me! <laughs> when the storm was over, the other sailors and shipmates questioned him. He said, Well, <laughs> if there isn't a God, there ought to be for times like these. Of course there is a God. I want you to know that Jesus Christ came into the world for people like us and for times like these. We're facing a lot of things in our world today. Things that a generation ago, even when I was a kid, we would have never thought we would have faced. Politically, we're facing pressures to relent on what we believe as evangelical Christians. Around the world, Israel is facing pressure from Palestinians. We're facing pressure from Koreans. We're all over the world. There's so much pressure in this world. If there was ever a time that we needed the Lord, it's today, friends. As the shadow of the cross loomed in their future and in his future, he was still concerned for those that were in the world. The Bible tells us earlier that he set his face toward Jerusalem. He, he intentionally was headed that way knowing that this Passover would come, knowing that he would gird his, gird his waist up and he would wash these disciples' feet, knowing that Judas Iscariot would go out and for a bag of silver would uh, betray him, knowing that Peter, the number one, a number one disciple, the one who would fight for Jesus three times, would deny his Lord. Knowing all of those things, knowing what he would face, he went because he was the savior of the world. He went away. His determination was the cross. You know, I love stories of determination. I don't know that there's ever a story of determination more important than the determination of Jesus. But several years ago, the two runners that finished second to last and last in the San Francisco Marathon, not half marathon, full marathon, 26 point whatever miles, right? I got, I've been order, meaning to order a little sticker that put on the back of my car that says 0, 0.0. People put 13.1 and 26.2, 0. Point, I don't run, right? But the, talk about determination. The guy that finished second to last didn't have any feet. But he ran the San Francisco Marathon. But he was only second to last. The guy that finished last said he thought it was real good that he only fell twice, seeing how he was completely blind. That's determination, friends, to run 26.2 miles and to finish something that you start. And it still pales in comparison to the determination that Jesus showed when he set his face toward Jerusalem. 
to die for you and me. The Apostle Paul was that type of person. He didn't rise to the level of Christ, but he said in Acts chapter 20, verse 22 through 24, And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. See, he understood what Jesus understood, and that is we have a purpose in this life, just as Jesus. How much greater the attitude of Christ in going to Jerusalem to face the cross, a certain horrible death. And when I think about him hanging there on that cross, listen to me. When I think about my Savior shedding his blood, I don't seem like some painters have painted him with this halo over his head and this pale-faced, effeminate Galilean. No, sir. This was a grown man. This was a man's man who laid down his life, who sacrificed himself for you and for me. What Jesus devoted himself to be and that's our Savior. Secondly, not only what Jesus devoted himself to be, which was our Savior, what Jesus demoted himself to be when he washed their feet, and that is our servant. And I won't read you again verse 2 through 14. It recounts him going down on his knees with that basin and washing the feet and serving the feet. And that's the real picture of this foot washing is, is Jesus was showing us how to be a servant, right? Because there is... Not many ways you can serve people any more than kneeling down and washing their dirty feet. Jesus didn't wash these men's feet because it was his unfortunate lot to do it. But it was because of his deliberate choice to serve them. Jesus chose to be a servant in all that he did. And we would do well and mind well to follow his lead and his example. It tells you a lot about a Savior when he's a servant. He didn't have to be first. He didn't have to be uplifted. He didn't have to be served. He said, I am meek and lowly. And Dwight L. Moody, the great preacher from days gone by, once said, the measure of a man is not how many servants he has, but how many he serves. Amen? That is what Jesus taught us. You see, you may be easy, easily too big for God to use, but you can never be too small for God to use. Amen? Amen. I remember a story from years ago in a church I served, and if I called the man's name, you would you would recognize it immediately. He was hosting some missionaries in his home. And these missionaries came in and they had traveled, I think, from the Philippines and they were tired. And they had speaking engagements the next day. And they were going around sharing what they were doing, these missionaries. The missionary was at our church on that Sunday morning. And he had stayed in the home of this gentleman. And when he woke up, he and his wife, in the night, this gentleman had slipped into his room, taken all their shoes and polished them and had them neatly laying in a row. And you say, that's a little thing. No, it's not a little thing because it says, Blessed are the feet of those who bring the gospel of the good news. And this man had served these people who had served Christ and given their life on the mission field. And it just has always touched me. Let's remember, true greatness comes when we get our eyes off ourselves. When we prefer others and we minister to others instead of ourselves and serve others in the spirit of Christ. You see, Jesus demoted himself to be our servant. Number three, what Jesus demonstrated him to be, himself to be, our standard. Look at verse 15 again in John 13. Because he set the standard for us. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. You see, Jesus set himself as our example about how to be a servant and, and our standard. Many times we measure ourselves by the lives of other people, don't we? Especially in the church, right? We measure ourselves by, well, oh, brother so-and-so does this, and I don't do that, so I'm all right, right? 
I'm in church more than this person. I must be better with God than them. And what we miss in that whole equation is, is the fact that we don't have but one to compare ourselves to, and that is the perfect spotless lamb of Jesus Christ. And in that case, we all fall short, right? Every last one of us. What Jesus demonstrated himself to be, that was our standard. What Jesus demoted himself to be, our servant, what Jesus devoted himself to be our Savior, and then finally, what Jesus declared himself to be our sovereign. We go back to the confrontation between Peter and Jesus when Peter said, No, you know, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, Well, unless I wash your feet, you got no part with me. And he said, Well, wash me all over, right? And Jesus said, You missed it. You missed it. <laughs> Peter finally submitted to the authority of of Jesus Christ. You know, many men and women have not done that in their lives, right? They've not submitted to the authority of Jesus. They have forfeited the authority in their homes. They've forfeited the authority in their families because they refuse to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ in their life. At this point, Jesus acknowledged that He was sovereign and is sovereign. He knew what his followers were about to see done to him. They were about to see those nails piercing his hands and his feet and that spear piercing his side. They were about to see the most humiliating thing that could happen to anybody happen to their Savior. And he wanted them to understand that it wasn't happening. He wasn't some victim. He was going there on purpose to that cross for them. He was sovereign. But beyond the cross, Jesus saw a crown. Amen? And that's really what we're celebrating with this Lord's Supper. Yes, we're celebrating the cross and what it did for us, but we're also celebrating the crown that Jesus took on his head after he had come, risen from the dead and ascended back to heaven, and he took his seat at the right hand of God. Now that excites me, friends, because my Savior and Lord is not bound by this world, is not bound by a Roman cross, is not bound by a Jewish grave, is not bound by anything, and he wears his crown. Anybody happy about that? I used to love gun smoke. How many of you like gun smoke? I love that show. You know, I'm named after Matt Dillon. Did you know that? I hadn't quite got the tall in the saddle thing down yet, but anyway, you would watch it and you'd see Matt, he'd get winged or something by a shot in the arm or something. He's just laying there, and you think one of those outlaws is going to do him in, right? But I know better, right? He's going to raise one leg up with one eye half closed and fire and shoot him right through the heart, you know? You know how I know that? Because I've seen the episode before. <laughs> and I knew it was going to be all right. Listen, I've read the end. I've seen this episode before. Jesus is the victor. And we have victory in Jesus. And that's what we're going to celebrate when we take this bread and this juice and do that remembering him. Would you join me in prayer?